Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And today we are going to go into part two of the story on Jonathan Luna. And for this one, I read The Midnight Ride of Jonathan Luna by William Keesling. I listened to Crime Junkie, two episodes of True Crime Garage podcast, and I listened to the 11-episode series of Somebody, Somewhere, and that was season three. Recap of part one. Walter Poindexter was dealing heroin, and one of his suppliers was Dion Smith from Stash House Records. Walter became close friends with Warren Grace and brought him into the business and taught him how to make really good money. Around January of 2001, somebody broke into and burglarized an apartment that Walter Poindexter was using to stash drugs, and he believed it was Alvin Jones, so he murdered him in retaliation. In 2002, the police raided the house that Warren Grace was staying at, and they found a scale heroin packaging materials and two guns, so he was facing a maximum of 40 years in jail. He decided to turn on his good friend, and he told the police that Walter Poindexter murdered Alvin Jones. The police gave that information to the FBI, and they thought, you know what? More than anything, they wanted to bust Stash House records. So they put together the Safe Streets program, and they were going to cut a deal with Warren Grace to make him an FBI informant. So that's where we left off on part one. Boy, I don't even know how to mini recap that one. (laughs) (laughs) You know, at the beginning, I was going to be like, oh, Hannah, shoot, I forgot. Why don't you give it a little (laughs) try over there? But (laughs) this one's a little bit more difficult. It is a lot tougher. There's more going on and a lot of people involved. Right, that's, yeah, that's why it's a little bit more difficult. Yeah, and I do actually want to take this time to um, maybe toss out a little bit of a warning on this one for the fact that, you know, there are so many people that are in this story, and as we go through each part, you're going to notice the same people coming up, but I do understand that the story can get kind of confusing because, We're not focusing solely on Jonathan Luna here. I remember Pug. Yes, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Warren Grace is known as Pug. (laughs) Um, So with that being said, I just wanted to make sure that everybody realizes that, you know, all of these additional stories that we're branching off into do make sense. And all of those players will keep repetitively coming back. Well, I figured as much. Okay, I just wanted to make sure, because we've never really done one quite like this before. Okay. I usually stay pretty focused on one person. Yeah, but when it includes so many others. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't think you just threw them in there for funsies. Well, you never know. (laughs) Maybe I just really want to give a good backstory. Just really want (laughs) to confuse me. That's Um, what it is. Honestly, that is one of my goals in life. Well, it's not that difficult, so... So. (laughs) Cool. (laughs) Agent Skinner had first heard of Warren Grace in April of 2002 when he was spilling all his secrets to the police. Agent Skinner waited to talk to him and tried to contact him immediately, but the Baltimore City Police were also busy talking with him. Agent Skinner would need to get an assistant U.S. attorney to file a writ of habeas corpus to bring him in. In general, FBI agents like to find themselves the young, inexperienced U.S. attorneys that are too afraid to push back. That checks. So Agent Skinner took the case to none other than Jonathan Luna. Together, the two of them were able to get Warren Grace out of jail and they brought him to the U.S. Attorney's Office for a little chat. They got a writ for him, meaning a court order that says the incarcerated person can be released into the custody of an agent or law enforcement officer, and this is temporarily. Then they have to be brought back to prison. 
Warren Grace had been picked up for heroin and gun charges. And just as fast as he went in, he was able to get time out for providing information That's and making know. secret deals. That's how they know when you're a snitch. Yeah. When you go in and then you're out right away. That's mm-hmm. how they know. Of course it is. This was obviously very appealing to him, though. During their first meeting, Agent Skinner was kind of testing the waters to see if he could even work with Warren Grace. Like, maybe they could work towards a plea agreement if everything went right. He did agree to plead uh, plead guilty to the drug and gun charge, and he was facing 10 to 20 years in prison. The aiding and abetting charge would be dropped, which would knock 10 years off of his 40-year sentence. That's a good chunk. It absolutely is. So, yeah, that would be appealing to him. Warren Grace was going to work with the government and cooperate with the FBI agents. If he testified truthfully, the government would make a motion to reduce his sentence. Jonathan Luna promised him that the court would take his cooperation into consideration. The rules of the agreement were to be spelled out when he formally accepted his plea deal, and that would be on May 31st of 2002. He pled guilty to a reduced set of crimes in federal court, and he was released from prison and went to a halfway house to begin his undercover work with Agent Skinner um, and the FBI, of course. He agreed to refrain from possessing a firearm, refrain from any use of narcotic drugs, and to only leave the halfway house with approval for official business. Well, a lot of people that end up in this situation literally don't do any of those things. Uh, and he broke out every rule. That's okay. what I'm saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, a lot of the time. Let's not be surprised about that. They have a tendency, not saying everybody does, but... They have a tendency to literally do the exact opposite of what you tell them not to do. Or, like, you're just like, please, just literally don't do these three things. They're going to do those three things. I'm sorry. Are you trying to convince me that criminals are doing Uh, something wrong or against the rules? Imagine that. Who would have thought? (laughs) Not everybody. I'm just saying. No, of course. It's, it's yes. <laughs> I mean, it's literally like the top three things that they were already kind of doing. So, right, the things that you got in trouble for, right. don't do them this time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, you All betcha. Right. <laughs> Not a big deal. No problem. No, no. <laughs> I'll get right on it. He was secretly paid by the FBI for his services, and I'm telling you. It did not take long for him to break all of the conditions that he had agreed to. Yeah. In the next year and a half, Jonathan Luna wrote a file full of legal papers that would need that would send Warren Grace back out to the streets, and Agent Skinner insisted on letting him run free. They knew that he was a menace to society, but they hoped that people weren't paying too much attention to him. He was running free and selling heroin. Jonathan Luna and the U.S. Attorney's Office assumed federal jurisdiction of Warren Grace's case, and that would include the entire investigation of Walter Poindexter and Dion Smith, including the drug-related murder of Alvin Jones. Warren Grace was instructed to apply for a public defender so that he would have representation for the plea agreement. He was bound over in federal court on May 2nd, 2002. My birthday. Just saying. I don't know if I've ever heard you do that. No. I've done it a million times, but I don't think I've ever heard you do it. I just thought it would be fun. Oh, my God. And it was. I'm so proud of you. (laughs) So, um, there you go. I was celebrating, probably, and then that was happening. What year was it? Uh, 2002. Oh, yeah. I mm, That's too much math to do. So, I probably <laughs> was into it at that point in yeah, time. Yeah, you probably were. Not that like, was like now. The little. That was like the little blip in time. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. That was your moment. I, yeah. I, I was still, still thinking birthdays were cool. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> So, the next day, 
Jonathan Luna and his co-counsel, Jacobed Rodriguez Cause, filed a federal defendant information sheet which listed FBI Steve Skinner as his arresting officer. Most of the paper trail tying Warren Grace to the FBI has very intentionally disappeared. Yep. Now, one of the biggest reasons for that is, of course, safety. You need to protect the source from other people. No one can know that somebody is actually working for the FBI. Yep. This protects both the FBI and the source. So Warren Grace's name was never listed on any reports. He's just referred to as source. But they also do not provide the gender either. A year after Warren Grace's arrest in May of 2003, Agent Skinner filed an affidavit where he talked about his early interest in uh, the Smith and Poindexter and 9-11 heroin. And the word source is used for every reference to Warren Grace. He had advised that Dion Smith was a drug dealer in the city of Baltimore who supplied heroin to a group which called its heroin 9-11. Dion Smith owned a recording studio called Stash House Records located at 911 West 36th Street, and he sold heroin from that studio. <laughs> God. You loving all those tie-ins uh, there? Yeah, that's um it's just magic, isn't it? Not obvious at all. No. Okay. Yeah. And 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 the fact that it's Stash House Records, like, come on. I know. Come on. What do you think is happening there? Holy shit. <laughs> like they're so obvious. It's ridiculous. It's kind of entertaining, actually. Yeah. But it's also that whole thing of like we are being so obvious because we don't just, just don't we don't care. Yeah. yeah. Like, nobody's going to do anything about it, so what's the difference? He had a Mercedes-Benz and a large sport utility vehicle. On May 31st, 2002, Warren Grace pleaded guilty to two charges. This was part of that deal that he made, and he was released on personal recognizance pending sentencing. He was assigned to a work release program, Hope Village, in Washington, D.C., and he was allowed to go out with the FBI or his attorneys. He got work release because he had a job working as an FBI informant. Per his agreement, he was not allowed to have a weapon, he could not use drugs, possess or sell them, and he needed to refrain from excessive use of alcohol. If he violated any of these terms, he was supposed to be returned right back to prison. That's what they always say. Uh-huh. Even one little mess up and you go back. Uh -huh. Okay. The staff of pretrial services opposed the entire deal, and they expressed concerns to the judge about releasing Warren Grace. The staff believed that he was a risk to the community, and they wanted him to remain behind bars. The FBI and Tom DiBaggio's U.S. Attorney's Office, represented by Jonathan Luna, wanted to turn Warren Grace loose. They felt that busting Smith and Poindexter was worth the risk. Warren Grace needed to be returned to the streets because, you know, he had to build up that street cred again. That way, Smith and Poindexter would never know that he was working as an informant. At this point in 2002, Walter Poindexter was behind bars. Agent Skinner's big plan was to release Warren Grace back into the streets, you know, have him fit back in with his old crew again, wait for Walter Poindexter to get out. Once he was out, Warren Grace would deal heroin to Poindexter and Smith, sending them back to prison then the FBI could infiltrate Stash House records. So that's the but, plan. But that's only if everything went perfectly. You and betcha. that is not how things went. What? Have you read this story? <laughs> starting to feel like I can predict a few, a few things in this. Interesting. Let's find out. <laughs> Warren Grace was released to Hope Village. 
And the first part of the plan was simple. He was supposed to work the program, follow the rules, and keep his mouth shut. A few days after he arrived, he was like, "Uh oh, my cover's been blown." <laughs> So, (sighs) what are we going to do about that? On June 7th of 2002, Jonathan Luna's co-counsel, Jacobed Rodriguez Cause, filed a motion to remove him from Hope Village. He wrote that in light of the fact that he was cooperating with the government, he should just be released. One of the counselors at Hope Village was... Just, like, free? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just let him out. Okay. Um, they did think, like, maybe he could do some house arrest and stuff. But one of the counselors was like, you know what? I don't love this idea. We just got him here. It's only been a couple of, you know, days. Not wanting him to be released. Somehow, the director of Hope Village was made aware of the fact that Warren Grace was cooperating with the FBI But he was told to keep that information confidential. On June 4th, 2002, Warren Grace was confronted by one of the counselors at Hope Village, and they directly asked him if he was cooperating with the FBI. Like, straight up? Yeah. Did he say yes? Um, no, he denied it. Okay. (laughs) I was gonna be like, oh god. I was gonna be like, dude, (laughs) did he just, like, crack right then and there? He's like, yeah, no, I sure am. No, no. He said he was not. Two days later, Warren Grace was informed by that same counselor within hearing distance of other inmates that the FBI was going to pick him up the next day. <laughs> okay. What? Uh, oh so my God. they're blowing up his spot here. Uh. <laughs> his uh, security had obviously been compromised, so he did need to be removed from the facility. Agent Skinner's solution was now, okay, let's place him under house arrest at his girlfriend's house. What? He's learning a lesson here, Hannah. Oh, my God. (laughs) Honestly, God, that is about the worst place you could put somebody that you're trying to keep off of drugs. Yeah. (laughs) But here we go. You're literally just throwing him right into that situation. Yeah. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. During home confinement, he was supposed to wear a 24-hour monitoring bracelet around his ankle. Pre-trial services did not agree with home confinement, and they again said, Warren Grace is a risk to the community. They made the obvious connection that you shouldn't return a known gun offender and heroin dealer to his home, and he should be detained. Home release was only available to defendants who did not have outstanding warrants. If anyone had checked, they would have realized that Warren Grace had two warrants, and that was failure to pay child support and traffic offenses. Judge Frederick N. Smulkin approved the motion for home release on June 7th of 2002. Agent Skinner began having interviews or meetings with Warren like two to three times a week. They would try to get specific facts from him. Then they they would go out and see if they could verify these things to see if he was like telling the truth or not. They also started giving him a recording device and sending him into Stash House Records to record his conversations with Dion Smith. God, I could never... No. I would sit. No, I can't. When it, like, comes to them recording shit, holy crap, that scares me so bad. Yeah. Because it's like, it, once they find out, you're, you're fucked. Honestly, like, I just, I don't think, it would fry my nerves. That's what I'm, yeah, for sure. I would be so jittery. Like, for you would sure. know. <laughs> like, not a doubt in my mind. But I wouldn't sweat. <laughs> That <laughs> I hate you for that, but it's true. I sure would. You would be sweating bullets. I would be drenched, and you would just be chilling away with not I'm even like, a single sparkle. <laughs> yeah. The local charges from Baltimore City were made into federal charges, and Warren Grace pled guilty to them. So the local cops were no longer going to be involved, and Agent Skinner told the local cops 
to leave his informant alone. I mean, he couldn't have the cops being involved because Warren Grace was out of home confinement back on the street selling heroin with the FBI's approval, and he was getting paid to do so. Yeah, no big deal. Yeah, so you can't have the cops getting involved in that, right? (laughs) In July of 2002, Walter Poindexter was in a halfway house, and he heard that his his pal, Warren Grace, was working with the police. (laughs) Ha! And talking about the murder of Alvin Jones. Holy hell, You know, because word gets around on the streets. Like, Mm -hmm. so quickly, too. Yeah. Warren had been going to the halfway house wearing a wire, and he was trying to talk to him. He was also working over at Dion Smith over at Stash House Records. So Warren Grace told Dion that he could teach him the secrets of heroin Because he knew how to cut it and combine it with fillers to dilute the heroin and increase the street value. He could teach Dion how to do this. Then Dion Smith could sell directly to Warren Grace at wholesale cost, cutting out the middleman. On one occasion, Warren gave $4,000 of FBI money to Dion Smith to buy heroin in an FBI-recorded sting. Dion Smith was dealing to him, and that was now on record, and Warren Grace sold heroin to Walter Poindexter while he was in the halfway house, which was also on record. Warren was allowed to come and go as he pleased. The court believed that he was on house arrest, but he was not. The FBI needed him to be available at any time to, like, keep up his appearances, because if He got called to the streets. He needed the freedom to go at any time. Otherwise, his cover would be blown. Which I guess that makes sense if you really think about it. It does because, like, a lot of that type of thing kind of happens in the middle of the night. At any time, yeah. yeah. And you have to be ready to roll. But, oh my gosh, this is just not good. They're throwing a lot of trust into him. Too much, one might say. Yes. One might say that. A lot more than one might say that. (laughs) That might be true. In August of 2002, Todd Stokes, home confinement specialist with U.S. Pretrial Services, writes a memorandum addressed to Jonathan Luna's co-counsel, Assistant U.S. Attorney Jacobed Rodriguez Cause, and the notice cited an apparent violation of Warren Grace's home release conditions. Jonathan Luna and Judge Smolkin were CC'd on this. Warren Grace had an ankle bracelet transmitter and a receiving device that was connected to the phone line. He reported on August 14th that the phone line had been disconnected, and nobody did anything about this for an entire week. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, so we're monitoring that really well here. So he was just completely running rogue during this time, buying and selling heroin, shooting guns. The neighbors even began to suspect that he was an informant at this time. Holy crap. So, I mean, he is not doing a good job at all. Now, I'm going to read you the memo for pretrial services, and this is a little long, but it gives a lot of context into what they actually were seeing. And the fact that this is overlooked just, it'll blow your mind. So Todd Stokes from Pretrial Services wrote, quote, On August 14th, 2002. Oh, hey, that's mom's birthday. Oh, my God. (laughs) It is. That's funny. (laughs) You were both farting it up this year, I guess. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So... On August 14th, 2002, Mr. Grace called me to advise that his phone service had been disconnected due to a delinquent bill, but that his girlfriend, Robin Summers, was calling her monitoring services and advised me the monitoring unit in the defendant's resident was unable to report. On August 15th, 2002, I spoke to the defendant on an alternate telephone in the residence. He confirmed his girlfriend paid the telephone bill and advised customer service was attempting to determine why her service had not been restored. On August 16th, 2002, 
Miss Summers advised me there was a wiring problem in the phone line and a technician would have to come to the residence. On August 20th, 2002, at approximately 12.20 p.m., I spoke with Miss Summers, who stated she expected a technician from Cavalier to come to the residence either August 21st or 22nd to repair the telephone line. I asked to speak the, to the defendant and she advised me he was taking a shower. Ten minutes later, the defendant called me back. I told him the telephone issue had to be resolved today. I asked him why the alternate line, which belongs to Miss Summers' minor daughter, could not be used for monitoring purposes. Mr. Grace initially stated he was uncomfortable using that telephone line, but then agreed. The monitoring equipment was immediately placed on the daughter's telephone line. On August 20th, 2002, I received a call from Special Agent Jeremy Gates of the Drug Enforcement Administration, advising me that an anonymous caller informed him that Mr. Grace had drugs and guns in his residence. Wow. And that he allegedly shot at someone at Park Heights and Wiley Avenues in Baltimore on August 17th, 2002. I'm so surprised. He related... <laughs> he related, should the individual call him again, he would give the person my name and number. Later that same day, I received a call from an unidentified male, essentially conveying to me what Agent Gates told me. He further advised me the defendant was outside his residence, that he manipulated the monitoring equipment, and he was hurting innocent people. Another individual got on the phone and indicated since nothing was being done to the defendant, he must be an informant. Yep. <laughs> on August 21st, 2002, I received another call from the unidentified male who again expressed his concerns about the defendant and stated that since nothing has been done to Mr. Grace, he would contact Internal Affairs. I was able to identify the telephone number of the individual through the use of my caller ID feature, and I provided Special Agent Steve Skinner of the Federal Bureau of Investigation with the number. I also apprised him of my discussion with Agent Gates and the anonymous callers. Agent Skinner went to the defendant's residence on August 20th, 2002 at approximately 5 p.m. and advised me that the defendant was not present. However, SecureCore Electronic Monitoring Services indicated he was in the residence. At approximately 10.35 p.m., Mr. Grace called me to advise he returned to his residence after working out. He acknowledged that he slipped off the ankle transmitter by saturating his leg with Vaseline. Oh, gross! <laughs> he related he was wrong for removing the bracelet, and that was the first time he had done it. Okay! <laughs> the defendant stated that Agent Skinner would transport him to the U.S. Attorney's Office in the morning. I told Mr. Grace to remain at his residence and I would meet with him in the morning as well. It should be noted when the electronic monitoring equipment was installed on the alternate telephone line August 20th, 2002, all events alerts were retrieved from the time frame when service was first interrupted and there was no indication that he left his residence during that period. An automated inquiry of the Maryland Criminal Justice Information System conducted on August 21, 2002, revealed no new arrests or outstanding warrants. However, on August 14, 2002, I received a call from Deputy U.S. Marshal Robert Johnson, who advised me that he received a telephone call from the Baltimore City Sheriff's Office indicating the defendant had two warrants outstanding for non-payment of child support and for motor vehicle offenses. On August 21st, 2002, Agent Skinner took the defendant to the Baltimore City Sheriff's Office to surrender relative to the warrants. At this time, Mr. Grace is in local custody awaiting an appearance before a commissioner. I recommend a warrant be issued and that the defendant's bond be revoked. So that's a lot of information. It was. But he's doing so much. I mean, he's taking off his ankle monitor. He's been real busy. He's shooting at people. He's hurting them. 
the neighbors know he's an informant. And they're, but they're not wrong. Like, if you see him doing all this shit and people are saying something and the cops aren't doing anything about it, it's informant. pretty obvious. Yes. Well, and obviously people that are involved in this kind of stuff or live in these specific areas and are seeing it all the time you know how it works oh and they're always watching it's obvious yeah i mean the slightest off with you anything off they they're gonna they're call gonna, it out they're gonna be watching you yeah so i mean we already have a lot of people here that are like um hi informant <laughs> a few weeks later Warren Grace was released back to the streets. Oh, my God. Is anybody surprised? No. (laughs) And this time, he was removed from home monitoring altogether. Oh. Yeah. They're like, listen, you were taking- already fucked up, so you might as well just do nothing, watch you. You were removing the monitor yourself, so we're just going to make sure it's fully removed. You don't need to do that. Nasty Vaseline thing. Yeah. <laughs> that is really gross. It's so freaking gross, dude. <laughs> oh. I mean. I don't like it. No, I don't like it. I I, I didn't even know that was a thing. Uh, yeah, and, like, Vaseline does not just, like, wash off. <laughs> it just grosses me out. I can't. <laughs> <sighs> I don't like the texture. Yeah, it's, 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 uh. Slimy. I, 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 okay, I need these images out of my brain right now. Just, like, lube it up his Stop leg. It. Shut up! <laughs> I need this guy. Shush. Oh, Shush. my Shush. God. Can you, oh, my gosh, and then he tries to take a shower? You're gonna fray and slip right through. <laughs> oh, man. He probably Just would, like, too. You open the front door and ski right outside. <laughs> People are like, why is he so slippery today? <laughs> Oh, man. I don't know. <laughs> Wait, does he, like, have to leave it on to slip the thing back on? Or is I, he re-Vaseline? I, I'm guessing you're going to have to, like, get that shit off and re-Vaseline. So many questions. You can't walk around with big piles of Vaseline on your leg, can you? I t- Isn't that going to soak through know. your pants? <laughs> That's going to be real gross. I hate all of this. <laughs> This is this is the worst. How do you keep your shoe on? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how we went down this rabbit hole, but I hate it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me more about the story that's not Vaseline related. Well, he was free. <laughs> <laughs> so Agent Skinner now had to write a report on this whole debacle and respond to everything that had been brought up in that memo. Oh, yeah, he accidentally just fell in the Vaseline, and then <laughs> the ankle monitor just it popped just on off. It popped off. <laughs> Who would have known that would happen? <laughs> I'm just as startled as you. <laughs> no, so his memo, um, or his response says, quote, On August 20th, 2002, at approximately 2.15 p.m., Ryder spoke with an anonymous telephonic caller who advised Ryder that an individual who was an FBI source had drugs and guns in the apartment which the source was living. The caller said that although source is is on electronic home monitoring, source frequently leaves the apartment. Specifically, the caller said that Source removes the electronic home monitoring bracelet from Source's ankle before leaving the residence, and that the Source will either place the bracelet on another individual or leave it in the apartment. The caller advised that Source was involved in a shooting the Sunday night before in the area of Wiley and Park Heights. The caller also spoke with Todd Stokes, a home confinement specialist with United States Pretrial Services. On August 20th, 2002, a Federal Bureau of Investigation consent to search form FD-26 was executed with source at the residence and source's vehicle. No drugs, firearms, or contraband were found during the course of the search. The electronic bracelet was found in source's dresser. Participating in the search were the following FBI Baltimore Safe Streets Task Force members— Detective Todd A. Moody, Baltimore City Police Department. Detective Glenn Hester, Baltimore City Police Department. Detective Katie Tyson, Baltimore City Police Department. 
So that's the end of that memo. Okay, so like, he put it on other people's ankles? How many people had Vaseline ankles? Um, I'm thinking like... I'm so uncomfortable. Several. <laughs> Maybe a whole block of people. <laughs> they just Every, trade out. Everyone's just sliding everywhere. It's yes. fine. Yes. <laughs> Holy shit, man. <sighs> okay. I'm I'm just picturing a lot of things happening here. But Yeah, we're going to we're going to keep rolling. <laughs> Slide on through. Yeah. Agent Skinner said that he contacted this anonymous caller and he asked to meet them in an isolated parking lot. But surprisingly, the caller never showed up. I was going to say it, please. No. <laughs> like if someone asks me to go to an isolated parking lot, absolutely not. No, I'm so, so good on that. I'm, like, probably out of the country if you ask me to do something like that. I, for sure. <laughs> I mean, even, when, really scary even when I, like, just pick up things off Marketplace, I'm, like, obsessively texting Megan the address, yeah. and then I'll, like, send her a screenshot of the person's Facebook. And then I'll, like, tell her when I'm there, and then I'm telling her when I'm leaving, so that, like, at least somebody knows what's happening. Mm -hmm. But to just go to a... An isolated an parking iso lot? <laughs> isolated parking lot. No, no. I'm all set on that, thanks. Absolutely the fuck not. <laughs> he and Detective Todd Moody asked the anonymous person for his name, but it was not provided. The tipster did say that he saw Warren Grace selling drugs and he was involved in a recent shooting. Agent Skinner went to Jonathan Luna and asked him to write a statement as well. Um, this was on August 29th of 2002, and prosecutors in Luna's office wrote a letter, quote, acknowledging Mr. Grace's violations and why they were opposed to him being taken off the streets. So... Jonathan Luna was helping to cover the FBI's tracks on this case, but he was also getting into some trouble of his own. A week after this, he was prosecuting a case against a bank robber and money went missing oh, no. during the trial. With a bank robber? Yes. And then money goes missing? It oh, come sure on. did. Come on. So... Agent Skinner claimed that he would call the pretrial officer a day before he was going to work with Warren Grace, and he would ask them to turn off his home monitoring device so that he could work with him. And for months, the task force had been recording conversations between Warren Grace, Dion Smith, and Walter Poindexter, and they were getting ready to move forward with their plan because Walter Poindexter had been released in August of 2002. The recordings were done with a digital body recorder that records digitally, so, like, there's no tape involved. The recording is downloaded onto a computer hard drive later, and then it's transferred into a CD-ROM. The other option is the one we would typically hear about or see in movies, which involves a radio transmitter. When this type of device is used, the agent can listen to everything in real time over radio waves. Since most of the recordings were done at Stash House Records, a recording studio, Agent Skinner was worried that they would get backfeed on their conversations and it would maybe broadcast through Stash House Records Shut recording equipment. Off. Which I was like, Oh, damn. I would never <laughs> go into that situation. So that is why they did not use that kind of recorder. Oh, my God. But. Boy, that would have been a, that would have been a situation. Oh, my gosh. Could you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> but this also puts them in a really interesting scenario here because, he, you know, Warren Grace is going into Stash House Records and he's recording these conversations and nobody's listening real time, so if there's a problem, you're they, on they your own, bud. Know. Yeah. Good luck. It seems that they also didn't want this recorded because Agent Skinner knew Warren Grace was dealing heroin. So if there's something that he needs to go I'm back sorry, later and get that, rid of... Was that a secret? 
(laughs) (laughs) To the FBI, I guess, to the rest of them. You know, so he's over here trying to cover this up. He can't have that from his informant. So they can't broadcast it and have everyone hearing. Just three weeks after he had violated his home confinement and was taken in for new warrants, Todd Stokes of U.S. Pretrial Services just uh, changed his mind. The new warrants disappeared. The child support was paid, most likely by the FBI. And Todd Stokes agreed to let Warren Grace out. On September 12th, Jonathan Luna and the FBI filed a motion of consent to modify Warren Grace's release conditions. You know, he, that's where he would be sent home with no home monitoring. And Todd Stokes from pretrial services suddenly <laughs> agreed. Just two weeks earlier, he wrote that huge-ass memo explaining all of the reasons why he should not be out because he was dangerous. Now he completely changes his tune, and here's what his new motion said. Quote, U.S. Pretrial Services recommends the following modifications of the above-named defendant's conditions of release. The Mr. Grace be removed from home confinement with electronic monitoring and pretrial serv- services supervision. Except as modified above, all other release conditions previously imposed shall remain in full force and effect. Assistant U.S. Attorney Jacobed Rodriguez Cause and Defense Counsel have no objection to this modification. So, you might think, how could this be? I'm not feeling that right now. No, not at all? Okay. Well, Agent Skinner had pressured him to get off the case. So... He convinced everybody involved that the investigation would be damaged if Warren Grace, quote, was taken off the streets. Todd Stokes told the court that Warren Grace should be removed from home confinement and Judge Smolkin signed the order on September 13th. The interesting thing here is Jonathan Luna was involved in putting Warren Grace back on the streets, which harmed the very people he was trying so hard to protect. How the heck are we only in September? <laughs> so much has happened. I know. There's a lot going on here. And, you know, we had talked in um, the first episode about how Jonathan Luna had grown up on the rough side of the neighborhood. And he knew how the streets worked. It was the driving force behind his desire to become a prosecutor. So whatever his reasons were, it seemed to go against everything he stood for. But he still did it. Warren Grace, while working for the FBI, was caught concealing heroin. And this was an obvious violation of his terms of release, but it was hidden for more than a year. The person that covered it up was Jonathan Luna. It's interesting to find out how much money the FBI was actually funneling into this whole scheme. They were paying Warren Grace. And apparently taking care of his child support. And they were paying for drugs. They handed Warren Grace $1,100 and told him how many grams to buy from Walter Poindexter. In the following weeks, on at least three occasions in September of 2002, Warren Grace gave Walter Poindexter a total of $5,880 of FBI money for heroin. my God. So they're putting a lot of money into this thing. These recorded drug buys continued into the next month, and on October 12th, Warren walked into Stash House Records and purchased $4,000 worth of heroin from Dion Smith with FBI money. On top of the, like, $5,000 he'd already spent. Of course. Wow. Sure is. That's a lot of money. Yeah. And you might be like, okay, why are we going so in-depth on Warren Grace here? What does this have to do with Jonathan Luna besides, you know, him signing off on things and helping to cover it up? Well, let me tell you. Jonathan Luna was writing about Warren Grace, the FBI, and the Smith and Poindexter case. That was the last thing he was writing about before he died. Oh, Yeah. Okay. So it really does all tie in. Okay. I had already, like, yeah, I got so lost in this 
part of the story that I was mm-hmm. not thinking that at all. I wasn't like, ooh, how does this tie in? Sure. <laughs> no, I was just really into this. But yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. There had been a family living in a corner house, and they were unfortunately smack dab in the middle of all of the chaos in the streets, and they were Aww. constantly being harassed. Like, oh, it was no. awful. They called the police over and over and over. But they either just didn't show up or nothing was done. The Dawsons were murdered in their own home. And the FBI's Safe Streets Task Force was nowhere to be found. This enraged Baltimore. And suddenly, people were paying attention. Hundreds of citizens gathered around the Dawsons' home and they demanded to put an end to the revolving door justice system. Some people even speculated that this was done by higher-ups who would profit from the drug trade. Baltimore's criminal justice system was out of control. It was corrupt. The police were being blamed for this tragedy. Reporter David... Well, they're in their fucking Mm -hmm. safe streets. Well, right. The FBI had that safe streets going on, and they weren't there. How many times they're like... They were like, oh, it's safe streets, and then the poor people are calling and calling and calling, and they're just like, no, fuck you. And you know what? We are going to get to it in a little while here. Um, It comes up later. But wait till you find out what the safe streets task force was doing when the Dawsons were murdered. Oh, it's going to piss me off, isn't it? It is. <sighs> okay. It's not good. Reporter David Montgomery filed a long article in the Sunday paper on November 17th that was super gross and, in my opinion, very victim blamey. Uh, he basically said that Angela Dawson was simply too harsh and should have spoken nicely to her neighborhood drug dealers. Jesus, I don't even want to hear this. And then this would have never happened. Okay. He quoted a neighbor as saying, quote, Another woman who lived in the same block of Preston said it's a matter of how you talk to the drug dealers. This isn't questionably victim blaming. This is like straight it absolutely up is yeah victim blaming. Um, I suppose there's always that one person that'll be like, I don't agree, and that's super fine. That sucks for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but to say like, oh, she should have talked nicer to the drug dealers. Are you out of your mind? Right. They were harassing this poor family. And it sounds like a lot. It was so bad. And it was on a daily basis. And she's trying to t- protect her babies here. You know? Yep. An investigation was launched to look into the heroin and crack dealers in Baltimore's nearby Park Heights area. This was kept quiet for 18 months, and just for the record, Park Heights was the area where FBI paid informant Warren Grace was documented on secret memos as terrorizing helpless neighbors. Jonathan Luna was, you know, keeping those memos hidden. On the very day that the Dawsons were murdered, here we go, Special Agent Skinner was unreachable because the Safe Streets Task Force was busy sending Warren Grace into Stash House Records to buy heroin. Awesome. Yeah, so that was kind of tying up all of their time there. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. After buying the heroin, he was supposed to meet up with the task force. His vehicle was searched because his vehicle was supposed to be searched after every single time that they did these, you know, little sting operations. And during this specific one, a package of heroin was found hidden in a storage compartment. For months, he had been buying heroin for the FBI, but surprise, he was was also dealing. He was buying it for himself, too? Well, sure, and he was dealing on the side. What? Who would have guessed that? I am shocked. Yeah, jaw on the floor. (laughs) So shocked. Yeah. Yeah. An unsupervised paid FBI informant caught dealing heroin was not a good look. Jonathan Luna was in a little bit of a pickle on this one. His boss, U.S. Attorney uh, DiBaggio, was already in a world of trouble and had scandals that he was kind of trying to smooth over. Now, Jonathan had to cover up this mess to protect himself, his boss, and the FBI. And that's a lot to take on. DiBaggio's office was exposed, to say the least. 
everybody was looking at them for answers after the Dawsons were murdered. In Washington, D.C., Congress was holding hearings to discuss the FBI and its mishandling of informants. Jonathan Luna knew he could end up taking the fall for this. On May 13th of 2003, the FBI finally raided Stash House Records and Dion Smith and Walter Poindexter were arrested. More than $50,000 in cash was confiscated from Dion's apartment. The day before the raid, Agent Skinner filed an affidavit of probable cause requesting a search warrant for the rap studio. Jonathan Luna filed a sealed indictment jointly charging Smith and Poindexter with heroin distribution and related violent drug crimes. He said, quote, Members of the conspiracy utilized physical force against members of the conspiracy and against members of the rival drug conspiracies to maintain their reputation in the community, to preserve their own territory, to punish members of the conspiracy who cheated or stole from the conspiracy, and to defend and maintain the loyalty of the members of their own organization. On January 22, 2001, Walter Poindexter, a.k.a. Fella, shot and killed Alvin Jones, a.k.a. L, because Poindexter believed that Jones was responsible for burglarizing the stash house where conspirators stored their heroin, money, and firearms. Jonathan Luna filed many documents and believed that he was strengthening his case against Walter Poindexter for the murder of Alvin Jones. He did his best to conceal the fact that the FBI's paid informant had been, you know, breaking the law many times. He wanted to prove that Alvin Jones's murder was obviously drug-related. Dion Smith requested a separate trial from Walter Poindexter, but Jonathan opposed this. He said, quote, The government's evidence will establish that Poindexter and Smith conducted a heroin distribution network in which Smith was the primary supplier of heroin. Poindexter, in turn, employed a group of street dealers, including Warren Graves, who sold heroin under the street name 911. The profits from the street sales of 911 heroin were shared by Poindexter and Smith. He said there were at least two witnesses ready to testify that they saw Poindexter murder Alvin Jones, and a joint trial would avoid more inconvenience and trauma for those witnesses. Walter Poindexter and Dion Smith were charged with conspiracy to distribute in excess of one kilogram of heroin from 2000 to May 2003, and that was signed by Jonathan Luna. He sought to prove that Walter Poindexter used violence to expand his heroin network. Warren Grace was going to testify that Walter Poindexter told him that he murdered Alvin Jones because he believed he committed the burglary. Alvin Jones's father, Alfonso Jones, was going to testify that his son had received a call and was very irritated. After he hung up, he said, quote, some bitch is accusing me of robbing some house. While discussing the upcoming trial, the judge did decide that Smith and Poindexter would be tried together for the drug offenses, but there could be absolutely no mention of the murder at the trial because that would be separate. If anyone even breathed a word of Alvin Jones, it would end in a mistrial, and if Warren Gray slipped up and mentioned that he was working undercover for the FBI, the whole thing would blow up in their faces. Cool, cool. So there's a lot of things we got to keep, you know, on the DL here. The dude that blew his cover in like three days flat. Yes. Okay. Now everything is riding on him. Awesome. Jonathan Luna had a meeting with Warren Grace and suddenly Warren was like, you know what? I grew a conscience overnight. He said he could never rat out his friend. Ha oh, Wow. <laughs> Which, of course, had been the literal plan for months, and it was the, the very time. reason yeah. he was free. Right. But now, how could he possibly testify against Walter Poindexter? He had been the closest thing that he ever had to family. 
The trial was days away, and they just did not have the time for this. So Jonathan threatened to revoke his plea agreement and send him away for decades if he didn't get up there and testify. The day before the trial, November 30th, 2003, Special Agent Skinner took Warren Grace out of jail, and he got a four-hour secret conjugal meeting with his wife in his Baltimore apartment. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've, I've got nothing for that. <laughs> okay. No. Nope. Nothing. So they're like, oh, you don't want to talk? We're just going to go ahead and let you do this. <laughs> Why don't you go? Have some fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, Jonathan Luna could have never known that he had less than 75 hours left to live. Ooh. The trial of Dion Smith and Walter Poindexter began on December 1st of 2003. So there you go, Hannah. We're already in December. Okay. Well, already? <laughs> <We're moving. laughs> it took us a long while to get there. It did. It was in the Baltimore Federal Courthouse before Judge William D. Quarles. Jonathan Luna was visibly nervous and stumbling on his words, which was not like him. But he called his first witness to the stand. Warren Grace. The judge asked the clerk to hand him a piece of paper to spit out his gum, but Warren swallowed it instead. Jonathan Luna began questioning the witness, but it just didn't go as he could have hoped. Warren Grace was mumbling his answers and he wasn't cooperating. The judge actually had to stop them and told Luna to take the evening to work with his witness and get him to be a little more pointed and answer more briskly. Wow. So that's not good. Judge Quarles also advised Jonathan Luna that he expected a more direct examination and would also expect that his questions wouldn't jump the gun and contain facts that hadn't been established. Judge Quarles had realized that it wasn't Jonathan Luna who was in charge of the questioning. Warren Grace was controlling him. The judge said, quote, We have a process we use called horse-shedding the witness. A hundred years ago, when I was an assistant U.S. attorney, I made it clear to witnesses that, you know, there was one person who was in control. He subtly suggested that Jonathan should try threatening Warren Grace to be more cooperative by using incentives and showing him how much better his life would be if he did what he was told. With that, court was adjourned for the day. And so is our story. Uh, oh, that was <laughs> slick. You like that? That was pretty slick. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so that was a good way to slide on into that with Vaseline, Vaseline. angles. <laughs> Vaseline, baby. <laughs> yep. So. Next week, when we slide in to our story, uh, we're going to go over how Jonathan Luna and the defense attorneys officially came to an agreement on the plea deal. He just had to get it in writing, but that never happened. We start going through the timeline of Jonathan's last night, and saying that it's odd is an understatement. Like, there's a lot of things that just are not going to make sense. Okay. After his death, there was basically a smear campaign to destroy his reputation. Ew. So that is very unsettling. Okay. Um, but I do believe that there are large reasons for that, and we'll yep. go over that. All right. So, there you go. All right, so make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I almost forgot. I was like, <laughs> where are we at? Leave us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, Bye. bye.